together again this evening. Grateful always for the opportunity to open up God's Word and gain insight and encouragement from, from His instruction. And we're going to be spending our time this evening briefly just looking at uh, kind of a, a brief overview of the book of Hebrews. If you would turn, if you're already at the book of Hebrews with that reading, just stay there. And we'll be flipping back and forth through some of the chapters in this book. The book of Hebrews is a, a wonderful book. It is a, a wonderful reminder of the superiority of what we have in, in Jesus Christ uh, versus what the previous um, uh, believers in, in God and his powers, the, the Jewish nation and that faith, um, those that were bringing, God was bringing them up to Jesus and talking about how, how much more superior we have it in Jesus. And, and in this, he is also demonstrating and revealing a lot of God's concern for a number of um, Christians who were rooted back in that Hebrew Jewish faith because it seems that they were starting to be heavily influenced that perhaps that was where most of their attention and their focus should be to, go, to kind of leave leave the simplicity or the focus just in Jesus, and that we focused our attention on that this morning, that the, Jesus as the bread of life wanted all of our attention and all of our focus to be so, uh, so uh, focused simply on him and him alone. Well, there was a number of individuals that started kind of leaving that and, and losing their focus on that, and so much of the book of Hebrews is from a fatherly point of view of warning offering pleading and even correction that was needed. And I want to just look at some of these uh, occasions that I believe also points to why we can be so grateful and so confident that we have a loving Father. We have a loving Father because no doubt He loves us so much that He sent Jesus, His only Son, to die for us. And in pouring out that amazing sacrifice of one who would allow uh, that which was most precious to him, most valuable to him, and so perfect to be offered on behalf of what we so desperately need in our failures and our sinfulness. But in addition to that, it is so amazing that God does not simply leave us to our own devices. God is very concerned about the choices that we make. God is very concerned about the direction that we go. And the book of Hebrews reveals to us how God, as a loving father, will seek to be very, very involved, to offer much needed advice, correction, discipline when needed. I want to look at how that is also something that we should always be grateful and always be thankful that our God is so concerned and so involved with us that even when we are in the process of making wrong turns or perhaps have, have been in that wrong turn for a while that God is continually seeking to get our attention in. But the, it opens there in the second chapter and he makes his, his intentions very obvious and very plain. He, he doesn't mix words. He describes his people that he loves and he says, you are drifting away and I'm concerned about it. In Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, he opens with this, this sentiment. He says, for this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we ne neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. This, this just so rings of, of the advice and the concern of a father. And I'm sure many of us have maybe been in situations like that, have had these father-child uh, talks, uh, father to son, father to daughter. Sometimes in life, right, when we're, we're going the right way, uh, our, the advice that has been given to us, it seems to be taking root and it is showing fruit and, and, and we're making good choices. 
And sure enough, just as the Bible says, we all like sheep, we all tend to wander. All of a sudden, our eye starts to see something else off the path. And we start believing that perhaps this was even be better than what we originally had already started following. And, and, and we build all kinds of cases in our head, right, and all kinds of arguments for, for why this would justify this, this sudden turn or, or this sudden change. And the book of Hebrews is revealing that God is so loving that, yes, at times he will, he will seek to try to show us, to try to alarm us, to try to grab us in full attention and say, I'm worried about the direction you're going. And what he's seeming to try to do is to try to make these arguments to try to persuade this child that all of a sudden believes and has convinced themselves that they found literally something truly better for them and try to remind them, no, you had it right. The, the, the first things that you had, don't throw those away. Do not neglect the original uh, truths, the original direction you were headed. You were going the right way, and he's warning him and trying to get them to come back. And, and throughout this book, he gets very, very specific. And we see this in chapter 3 in the reading. If you continue reading, um, notice as he continues to try to encourage his, his people, his children, to be uh, warned about the potential downfall and how bad it could be if they continue and seeking to try to get them to change course. We continue reading in, in chapter 3. And notice in verse 12, again, he gets very, very specific. And one of the things he's concerned about is a spirit of unbelief. He says in chapter 3 in verse 12, he says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. That's key. He says, if you want to get all the benefits, if you want all the rewards, you have to keep going the right way. And he says, I'm concerned about you because I think if you go ahead with this detour, you're headed... You are about to throw away all of the blessings that you once were, were, were right on course and, and headed right for it. And I love this, that God needs to be with this, very, very direct with us. And because of that very reason that sometimes we, we conjure up and we build arguments right and justify things in our minds, it's something we would be very, very difficult to reason with. All the more reason for God to be very, very direct and say, you need to think about what you're doing here. We need that. We need those who are concerned for us to that level to say, I don't know if this is such a good idea. I don't know if this is going to result in what you have built in your mind it's going to be. And that's how God is talking to them. I realize that sometimes we maybe, if we've had moments like that, maybe with our own parents or others that we love, that we're close to, can uh, feel as if, well, why, why are you talking to me like that? Why, why are you saying things like that? Why, 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 are, you, why, why are you such a, a buzzkill? Why, 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 why are you just, just discouraging? Well, because we care, right? Because we care, and this is showing just as much love and devotion from God as Him giving wonderful gifts that they didn't deserve and, and, and filling them with His love and filling them with His encouragement and with His, his energy and with His power. But it shows just as much love, perhaps even a, a, a deep abiding love that God would seek at times to, to, to all of us at times to reach to us and say, I want to address what's happening here and I want to make it very, very clear that there are some very dangerous roads ahead that I don't know that you see the implication of where you're headed. And that's what he's doing. He says in verse 14, we, if, we, if we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end, while he said today if we hear his voice, 
do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. That's, again, God's calling them out. <laughs> He's saying, I already see it happening. I can see it in your face. I can see the look. You've already, you've already decided. You've already determined. And you're hardening your heart. And you're not willing to listen to counter advice that you need. We do this so easily sometimes. I know. I know what I'm doing. I love how God <laughs> is challenging them. That I don't, I'm not so sure you know what you're doing. <laughs> is what he's saying. He's saying, do not harden your heart. And don't be so so quick to follow this through. I want you to listen to some things I want to tell you before you go through with this, is what he's saying. In verse 16, he says, For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? I can remember times, maybe this rings true, true of your situation. I remember times when... Um, you know, maybe it was something, maybe my father, you know, maybe was riding in the car with me and could see maybe how casually I was handling maybe uh, stop signs or <laughs> turns and things of that nature. And I remember my dad sitting there very clearly and going through a whole list of moments that he knew, people, events he was aware of where people had, had paid costly, paid dearly for not paying attention on the road. I remember the time I was like, Dad... No, I didn't needed to hear that. And they needed to hear this. And we, at times, are going to need to hear this. And let us never, ever mistake when we have moments when we need to be called back to double-check, to reassure, to make sure that the path we're headed is consistent with where God would want us to go. Let us always, at first, be grateful that someone is talking to us that way. Because that is coming from someone who loves us. Clearly, this is the love of God for his people. And he's concerned. And just as I remember talks with my father, and he would pull out all those, les those history lessons. Let me tell you, there's someone I saw, and I knew they're just, just about your age, and about this same stretch of road. A night just like tonight. And all these things that I... I was just so adamant, I know what I'm doing, I know, I know, I know how to handle this, and I needed to hear that continuous <laughs> history lesson of accident after accident after destructive consequences. And that's what he's doing. I'm sure they probably didn't want to hear this right now. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you. I want you to think back to a group of people who are kind of similar to where you were. And many of these individuals lost their souls because they wouldn't let God redirect them. And they headlong just went ahead, went right into it. And notice in verse 18, and he says, And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Many times what this unbelief is speaking of, we sometimes don't believe that the warning signs our God gives us are really true. We dismiss them, right? Uh, it's, that's being over, overly cautious. He says, no, they, they, they suffered because they didn't believe what God was saying. If you do this, this is what this could lead to. And they didn't believe it. They dismissed the, the legitimacy of it. And perhaps even dismissed even the legitimacy of God even wanting to tell them these things. Maybe perhaps Satan got in their ear the same way that Satan got in Eve's ear. Oh, he's telling you these things because of ulterior motives. He really doesn't care. He's warning you because of this. He's telling you because of that. And, and God is very concerned when we face crossroads and, and we need to be corrected. And this continues throughout the book. He, he doesn't let up. Um, turn over to chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10. And we see it continue. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. He says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, 
which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Why does he say this? Why does he say without wavering? He's calling them on this and saying, I see wavering. And, and, and if you can address this, if you can eliminate that, if you could be more certain, if you could be more confident and more direct about your devotion to Christ, then yes, we can see you succeeding. But there's some wavering he's noticing. He says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And again, he calls him out. He says, and I know why sometimes you waver. He says, let's look at your attendance record. So let's look at your attendance record. Could it be? <laughs> again, I know these are sometimes there's a touchy subject. We sometimes we don't, we don't want someone maybe getting that specific. He does. He says, no, I, I, know, I know why there's wavering. <laughs> he says, it's not a secret to me. Let's, I want to encourage you to continue to, to seek opportunity to be with those of like precious faith. To not forsake it. He says in verse 24, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Again, as a good father, um, let me tell you about some people that maybe started having a little bit of inconsistency in their life, and I'm going to show you what happened. And that's what he's doing. He's a loving, he is a loving father. He is a loving father who is concerned deeply because there is wavering, there is an unbelief, there is a hardening of heart happening. He sees it and they don't. And he wants them to be woken up to it that they might see what he sees. And he continues this. And notice in verse 26, how serious is this? How serious is something like this of just something wavering and disbelief? Verse 26. He says, let's, not, let's stop kidding ourselves. The, the, the real issue here is sin. But all these things are related. That's why he, he begins, he says, now if we can, notice in verse 26, if we go on sinning willfully, where did that come from? Sinning willfully. He says, I know, because when you start wavering in disbelief, when you start finding yourself less committed in certain aspects of the things that Jesus wants you to be committed about, that's where these sinful habits start popping up. And that's, yes, where the real danger comes from. But as he says, for if we go on sinning willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a, a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. I remember one time my, my father I'd, had brought home a report card. Uh, I'm, I, I'm so embarrassed by it, I'm not going to tell you. It hinted what it was on it. <laughs> you can guess pretty, pretty much about the fact my dad had to have a talk with me. It was bad. And I was bracing myself because I know my dad knew that I was in danger of not doing the right thing. He would let me know. It was very unusually calm, which really made me nervous. And he just looked at me and he said, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but there's a, there's a school in New York. It's for clowns. It's called Clown School. And you can go there for free. And I said, okay, thank you. <laughs> And he said, because it's obvious that that's what you want to be, because if you come and bring grades like this, well, that's the only school you're going to be able to go to. <laughs> and I got his point pretty quickly. <laughs> this is how God is talking to his people in this chapter. I'm going to tell you right now, if you want to continue going on this way, this is what you're going to end up with. And this is the only thing you're going to end up with. I don't know if you really want that. You probably don't want that. You probably don't realize the implication of it. Let me make it very plain and clear to you. That's why he says it this, this emphatically. 
Notice what he says. He says, if you go on this way, if you keep going the pattern that you continually go, and you don't see the impact, you don't realize how bad it is. Let me spell it out for you. There will no longer be a sacrifice for sins. You won't find sacrifice anywhere else. You won't find grace anywhere else. And so if that's what you want, I'm just going to tell you that's what you're going to get. Yes, that's... <laughs> His father is speaking because they need to hear this. Because why? Because gently prodding has not been working. Little reminders have gone unnoticed. Little, I uh, just want to say, just maybe, maybe, maybe you forgot this, has long gone. Now it's time for direct, more serious talk. God loves us when he talks to us this way. He needs to talk to us this way at times. We need to hear, hear it to that level. But that's what he says in verse 27. There will be a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Notice verse 29. He's getting very specific. How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace? I, the, the tone is eerily similar to me. <laughs> Just as my dad said, I don't know what college you think you're getting into, son. <laughs> That's what he's saying. I don't know where, I don't know if you really understand the implication here. How, notice the language, verse four, how, much, how much severe punishment do you think you're going to get? I don't think you've thought about it. He's concerned. As a father should be. And as he's later going to point out, as we recognize, any loving father has always demonstrated this way of reaching out to us. But that's what he says. Notice in verse 29, he says, How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? Now, he's laying it on pretty thick right now. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I remember with my dad, when he, it's a terrifying thing to go into life without a game plan, son. That's what he was trying to communicate to his son. And at times I need my spiritual father and others in our lives to, yes, to, 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 to tell us And let us, in those moments, take pause and listen. Part is part of all that. <laughs> to listen. To recognize this is coming from love, and it is our, our responsibility to listen. They love us enough to tell us these things. They love us enough to warn us of these things. Let us take a moment and listen. And listen. As we continue... Throughout the book, we see again here in chapter 12. He lays out kind of really the whole, let me, let me explain to you why I'm talking to you this way, son. He kind of comes back a little bit and kind of gives the birds the overview. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. He says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. In other words, as a good father, as a loving father, he's listed all these weights, all these unnecessary items that they, he has watched his children keep taking on and adding on and and and. and and accepting in their life. And he says, you need to get rid of half of these things. These things that you think you need, these things that you think is beneficial, you need to get rid of it. That's why he's been talking this way. He wants them to listen to that directive to know that these things are not beneficial for them. But if they will listen, if they will take courage and they will accept this guidance, he says, you will be able to run this race. And he says in verse 2, you need to fix your eyes on Jesus. In other words, just as Jesus encouraged us to say, He is the bread of life, we also need the Father. 
to tell us as his children when our eyes are not fully fixed on that bread of life and to redirect our, our attention. And so that's what he's doing, trying to help them realize if you can just refocus your, your eyes, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect so many of these other issues that I'm warned, worried about you. So notice what he says in verse... E, in chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3 says, For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Two things from that passage. One, when it's the loving, wise, all-knowing Father who's speaking, all the more reason for us not to argue against him, but for us to quiet our mouths and accept this direction and this assessment he's made of us when, when we need to hear it. And two, to remember He's saying this because he loves you. Because he loves you is why he's saying this. And notice in verse 7, it says, It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? In other words, let us relish in the fact that he considers us such uh, 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 sacred members of his family that he feels he has the right to talk to us that way. That's the point he's making. We don't talk that way to total strangers. <laughs> I hope we don't. <laughs> that doesn't <laughs> go very well. We talk this intimately, this specifically, this directly to the people we love. And that's what he's trying to plead with them. Don't lose sight of that. All the more reason for you to take a moment and calm down that sense of resistance and listen. Listen. And notice in verse 7, he continues, he says, It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we received them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline, for the moment, seems not to be joyful. He says, Let, let's be honest. I, I, I understand that's the hard part about it, because it's not joyful. It stings when we hear these things. Especially when we've hardened our heart. Because it's very difficult to accept, I may be wrong, when I've already said, no, I'm pretty sure I'm right. <laughs> That's the discipline. It's that disciplining sense of you need to admit, I don't know that you're ready to go ahead and make this complete decision. So he said, now remember, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful. It seems to be intrusive. It seems to be uh, judgmental. He says, yet those who have been trained by it afterwards, here's the key, afterwards yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So what a, an important lesson for us to take just by, as we see some of the specific things and things that come out of this book. But what you will find, if you've had a father who's ever talked to you in a very direct, needful way, is exactly how God is speaking in this book. It, re it reminisces so much. The very directness, the maybe layers of sometimes sarcasm of, I doubt, I think you know what you're doing. <laughs> Let me, can we give you a little li list of things that you may not be aware of? He's, do he's talking to them that way. Remember, he assures us it is because he loves us, because he knows that we are in danger of not listening to his direction. A couple more passages and we'll end our lesson, but turn over to Luke chapter 11. Jesus reminds us of this, of how important it is that we never lose sight 
that when we feel that sting, when we feel that rebuke, and we want to resist it, remember who it's coming from and consider it that we might take pause. And in Luke chapter 11, he reminds us of this. In verse 9, Luke chapter 11, verse 9, he says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he is asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? So he's, he pulls us back, as, as the Hebrew writer also does, to our common, familiar relationship with our earthly fathers. That didn't we always respect that our fathers kind of, they knew the, the right thing to tell us. Even though they're evil, what does that say? Even though, well, we're not always perfect. We don't always do it perfectly, but that's besides the point. <laughs> the point is that a father in the position of a loving father, and we need to keep this in mind, well, well, well they didn't say it perfectly or they didn't communicate it perfectly. Just that's Sometimes that's, we've hardened our hearts. But can we need to accept that a father in a position of experience, of leadership, of proven track record knows what they're talking about. Knows how to direct the child. That's what he's saying. So let us keep that in mind. From an earthly perspective, these teachers, these leaders in our life, they know what they're speaking about. How much more, he says. How much more when our perfect father speaks to us like that so he says in verse 13, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? There is no imperfect way our father communicates these things to us. It is always perfect. It is always right. And you know what's interesting about that? And often he in his perfect wisdom will often use <laughs> the imperfect uh, approach of, of, of each other. And that's often how he communicates, as he's communicating through a, a, a man in the book of Hebrews, an imperfect man, relaying the perfect instruction of God. And so let us humble ourselves. Uh, let us work on that. It's so difficult, I know, at times, but we, as I think about the things in the book of Hebrews, it seems like that's such a, a neat a needed reminder for us. Let us always keep in mind that there are certain things in our lives that we, we need to be called out to pause, to think, to reflect, and to let certain things be given a proper assessment of where we're headed and what we're doing so that we can analyze it correctly and know it's coming from love, it's coming from wisdom, it's coming from correction. And one final passage, turn over to Lamentations chapter 3. As we, as we pull back in all these things, let's always remember, let us always be grateful to our Father who always seeks to intervene for us when he th believes that we are acting like sheep again and, and wandering and straying. In Lamentations 3, I love what he says in verse 31. He says, For the Lord will not reject forever. For if he causes grief, then he will have compassion according to his abundant loving kindness. For he does not afflict willingly or grieve the sons of men to crush under his feet all the prisoners of the land. He's not doing it to, to crush us. He's doing it that we, again, might see the, the blessing, that we might truly rejoice as we find ourselves in alignment with his directive to praise him and thank him, how much he loves us, that he's so concerned, that he has things to say to us in the choices and the directions we go through in our lives. So let's, let's all reflect ourselves. And as we have listened to these things from the book of Hebrews, can we apply them to ourselves? Uh, are there perhaps evidence in our life that we too are drifting from being completely devoted uninterrupted in our service to God? Or are we allowing certain things and justifying certain things in our life to get in the way? 
to hinder us or to accept and, and, and bring other things into our lives that clearly is not going to be conducive for the strength and the encouragement we need to continue to press on. Let us be honest in these assessments and let's be thankful to God who loves us, who wants us to be corrected and to go the right way. If anyone is with us and never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, we encourage that you might take, an opportunity this, uh, take advantage of this opportunity to make the great confession that as we recognize the great love of God to send his only son to die for us, let us confess that. If you believe that Jesus truly did die for your sins, make that confession. And based upon the, the truth and the power of that confession, you can be forgiven of your sins by being baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins based on aligning, your, or aligning, uh, aligning yourself with that truth of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus who died for you that we might die to our sins and live for him and let him cleanse us by his blood. If anyone needs to do that, if you need, or perhaps to come back to the Lord in, in rededication of, of, of being more committed, and we, if we can help you, if we can pray for you and encourage you in some way, we're here to help with you as, with that as well. But whatever the case is, once you come to the front, let us help and assist you. Be right with the Lord while we stand.